As a major transit node, the intersection of Sunset and Fountain stands to become a center of high-density residential construction under proposals like SB50 and transit-oriented communities. For this reason, it offers a particularly salient opportunity for the architectural proposition of a forest in the city. The area is characterized by a diverse mix of single and multifamily housing, strip malls and car washes, as well as institutional spaces ranging from a hospital to the Church of Scientology. Yet this diversity of uses is bound together by the familiar Angelino Sprawl. Despite being one of the densest areas of the city, building heights rarely exceed 35 feet. Calls for a denser, more sustainable lifestyle are nothing new. Yet opposition to even modest construction, often under the banner of Not In My Backyard, have only grown in recent years. In his 2014 text, Country of Cities, Vishan Chakrabarti reminds us that if we all elected to live in townhouses, nowhere near the density of America's urban downtowns, all of Earth's 7 billion residents could fit into the state of Texas. Today, 61% of Americans still live in single-family homes, with only 4% living in townhouses. As the need for density and housing period grows, the area of interest lies in expanding the sliver of urban residents living in apartments with 30 or more units. This loyalty to the single-family home is not only unsustainable by the merit of the structure itself, but also by the extended spaces packaged within it. The backyard wasn't considered an extension of the home until the 1950s and the advent of the suburban ideal. As the 40-hour work week brought increased wages and consumer power, families brought patios, pools, and well-kept lawns, symbols of prosperity to provide a sense of paradise outside one's own home. Yet this segmentation of space for nuclear families from broader community contact also brings isolation. The sovereignty of the home comes at the expense of public life. This is particularly clear in many of Los Angeles' empty front yards, some a barren extension of the sidewalk, some covered in dense hedges. Yet, neighborhoods of respite exist for the long-neglected front yard. As Jeffrey Ho writes, middle-class Americans put their daily habits in the backyard. Latinos bring the party, workspace, and conversation to the front yard, creating activity in the public space. What happens when we incentivize this front backyard inversion, freeing up new spaces at the center of LA's sprawling suburban blocks? One answer has already been extensively explored throughout Los Angeles, the conversion of what was once garage or shed space to accessory dwelling units, now legal throughout California. These backyard homes easily densify and reduce wasted interior block space. Another strategy involves returning to Dolores Hayden's 1980s collectivization of the suburban block, in which backyards are surrendered as block-wide common space for playing, gardening and socializing in an attempt to flatten hierarchies and alleviate suburban ennui. Perhaps where Hayden's plan falls short is in the co-opting of parts of existing homes, rather than creating new central structures. Taking stock of every square meter of land within the site validates this interest in backyards and found spaces. The area is relatively dense by Los Angeles' standards and nearly half consists of low-rise residential buildings. Yet front, back, and side yards, driveways, and the omnipresent parking lot all present ways to rethink moving through and living in this sprawling city. This inquiry is centered at the intersection of three neighborhoods, East Hollywood, Silver Lake, and Los Feliz. These three distinctive areas present a dichotomy of lifestyle and domesticity in LA. Predominantly white, affluent residents in Silver Lake and Los Feliz have become the stereotype of the American hipster. East Hollywood, the third densest neighborhood in Los Angeles, is home to young, working-class families. Predominantly Latino and low-income, East Hollywood's density in an otherwise familiarly low-rise neighborhood comes at the cost of overcrowding. A reminder that many of the units coming on market today are not only unaffordable, but too small for families. The area is not only the intersection of two lifestyles, but also of Los Angeles' two grids, the Spanish colonial Ord grid, oriented to the sun, and the American checkerboard Jeffersonian grid, which slashes east to west to form LA's familiar system of streets and boulevards. This intersection provides unusual view corridors, producing an almost diorama-like urban layering effect. 
Common moments of lifting, often as casual as a car wash or motel hallway, frame these layered views, creating illusions of unlikely adjacencies between commercial and residential and collapse typologies. The project is situated adjacent to the primary commercial corridors along Sunset and Fountain at the center of the study area. Although this intervention is site-specific, the concept speaks to exemplary conditions for addressing increased density throughout the LA area. Here, a linear strip of surface parking along Fountain anchors further development into the block. This necessitates taking over backyards of four single-family homes on the western side of the block to link two linear spaces together for an infill strategy. The project proposes a 12-story residential building on this site that, despite its narrow footprint, offers a vision of increased density able to accommodate different residential experiences, representative of its diverse context. At 11,100 square meters and with an FAR of 11, the building challenges current zoning limitations. This perspective shows the building from Fountain Avenue looking east, and showcases the use of heavy timber framing augmented by wood infill panels and louvers throughout the facade. Exterior expression takes inspiration from the German tradition of Faktschwerk. Directionality, offsets, and angles inform the facade as they do the massing. Programmatically, the building operates in two sections. The street lining front bar houses a series of split-level co-living clusters, while the interior bar contains a more typical mix of one to three bedroom apartment units, which are oriented around open air cores and shared space. At the ground floor, the project proposes a completely open and public interface connecting the neighborhood to a small public library and exhibition space on the second and third floors. Beginning from a consideration of growing and branching, the massing and structural logic follows a trapezoidal form, which flips, joins, and merges along set seams. These organizations provide a mass timber structural logic that draw from the strength of diagonal vertical members bolstered by deep girders, eliminating the need for contiguous central columns. CLT floor panels provide further stiffness, and tying back to the CLT cores enables much of the branching and growing, allowing the slender base to support a structure that rises, rather than looms, above its one to two story neighbors. This footprint and structure provides a framework to interrogate ways of living. As mentioned in the program diagram, the street facing bar of the building is home to co-living clusters. Here, one module houses a pair of dense, split level clusters. Each is composed of a private, parceled sleep floor connected to an open, social living floor. As this unit matrix shows, specialized co-living and intergenerational units maximize their structurally supported footprint, while more conventional rectangular units ranging from one to three bedrooms provide a looser fit. Notably, the project does not work with unit minimums. These spaces are designed for family, gathering, and flexibility thinking aspirationally about the chance for emergence of new collectivized systems of economy and lifestyle. As previously mentioned, the project involves taking over the backyards of adjacent single-family homes. This diagram shows the unchanged conditions at the ground plane, with a typical configuration of private space towards the interior of the block. The intervention in sequestering these formerly private spaces proposes a trade-off in which the front yards become more private and the affected homes become part of a more public interface towards the block's interior. This provocation entails a radical shift in notions of sovereignty over urban space. Collectivity and shared experiences are presented as a means of dismantling the unwavering individualism that contemporary urban environments tend to embody and protect. The project creates a public throughway from Fountain Avenue to Hoover Street, which frames space for two residential lobbies, piecemeal retail spaces, and an 80 square meter ground floor extension of the public library at the northern edge of the site. The proposition of increased urban density put forth by the project as a whole begins in earnest at the ground floor. With only minimal encroachment into existing single-family lots, the overall use of space is intensified for both public and private realms. Communal and open spaces flow up through the building. A 1,300 square meter library and exhibition space span the second and third floors, while shared open-air circulation continues to serve the various residence types above. The fifth floor plan shows the sleeping floors of two co-living clusters, as well as several standard units, both oriented around respective communal spaces. The sixth floor reveals the living floors of the co-living clusters and higher density collection of private units. 
In section, one can observe the relationship between new units and existent housing, as well as the aerial courtyard conditions that emerge as upper units branch outward, allowing the project to view itself at more internal moments. The design offers both these internal exchanges as well as moments of encounter between the building and its context. Public entrances to the site are characterized by the interface between low-rise residential context and the proposed design, as sharp transitions in height and program are moderated by a near ubiquity of open-air public space. In an already decentralized Los Angeles, density can no longer be relegated to certain areas of the city. This design offers an approach to high-rise density mixed with quintessential LA housing typologies and suggests that we can move forward without losing our past. Mass Timber offers new opportunities for sustainable density, both in construction and living. In the face of a housing crisis and growing anti-development sentiment, this project pushes the limits of mass timber construction to reject calls for modest density and posits extremes in its approach to density as in its approach to living together. What I learned from this studio is that what triggers me most is directing the views and experiences of people while moving, how to excite, surprise them, how to make the rides fun. The central idea for me to engage in mobility is to weld the discontinuity during each transit and to make everything straightforward, including experience. Every time when I start a design, I will try to better organize the pedestrians and the different size vehicles and try to provide both the walkers and the drivers an efficient and enjoyable experience. What I learned in this year is to imagine the circulation pattern of how people and things can move interactively in buildings or urban areas. The one-year study of mobility encourages me to use movements to reform the architectural design in a flexible way. Now we are pursuing it in the coming 10 years. This year's study in Mobility Studio made me most interested in people's experience in various mobility modes. In future career, I will use the user's experience as a mode of spatial organization to create a new typology and build it in practice. A kilo part profiles and moving particles. This one year study in Mobility Studio helps me move away from the design of single buildings to projects which combine architecture with different modes of mobility. At UCLA, I learned to give up the need to control. Architecture is about making people flow into a space and letting them decide where they want to be inside it. I've learned that a solution can be simple, might even seem absurd. But if you believe in it and work on it, it might just be the best thing ever. My name is Sherbin. During my study at Mobility Studio, I learned to use computer simulations, not only as a research tool, but also as my main design tool. In Mobility Studio, I see the power of new technology for supporting great ideas. My interest is to develop an own design method with new tools. This year in the Mobility Studio, we started the other way around from the way we've done it before. Typically, we've looked at Los Angeles as an innovation center for mobility, and that would be everything from ride hailing, like Uber and Lyft, to scooter sharing, like push scooter sharing, like Bird or Lime, to one of the largest bus networks, in the United States or the world, and also one of the most sophisticated traffic management systems in the city. We worked with Salita Reynolds with the LA Department of Transportation. We worked with BMW Design Works, and we spent 10 weeks conceiving a mobility hall where a new building typology dedicated not to parking 
and uh, a terminal, but dedicated to the exchange from bus, rail, to ride share, to scooter share, to electric bicycle, could all happen. And we thought if that should be a new kind of a space in the city, if it should have a landmark quality, if it would be a place for tourists to come and experience a lot of these new mobilities that you can only experience in Los Angeles first. And uh, we worked on that thinking from the most urban scale of transportation flows into uh, a kind of a single room space or a single building um, in different cases for different students. We then took that knowledge and went to a site and looked at what a mixed use retail experience would be like. So how uh, your daily shopping, how destination shopping, how the kind of grab and go might work and how all of that shopping could move both from your phone to physical space, as well as rethinking physical retail in connection with how people move and the new ways people move through the city. Halfway through that project, we were surprised and along came uh, COVID-19. A lot of the things we were thinking about, like getting in the back seat of a stranger's car who's an Uber driver, suddenly seemed uh, not tenable. But other things like picking up curbside, like relying on your local neighborhood shop, a lot of these things suddenly became very viable. So uh, it was a very interesting year for us where we were thinking about the future of transportation. We were thrown a totally new paradigm of how people move around the city and how they live much more locally and were relying much more on local shops as markets and uh, using a kind of a grab and go economy. And we are just wrapping that up now. And it was, uh, I would say, a spectacular year for me, starting from the most urban scale and bringing it down to building problems, which is very different. We previously had thought about how does micromobility change the way you move through a building vertically? Does it change the way you enter a building? Do electric vehicles and no parking mean that you can go deeper into the building with vehicles? Now we went the other way around and thought, how is the city changing and how does architecture have a conversation with urban planning with people like Salida and Laura Robbins at BMW Design Works? And also how does architecture participate at the building scale to integrate all these urban flows into something which is very concrete and spatially experiential? Vending machines stack on mobility that distributes mobility elevators at the ground floor. The problem today with transportation hubs is that they can feel like a labyrinth because people can get lost. One example is the Port Authority in New York City. This project proposes that vehicle comes to you instead of you looking for them. The hub is expressed as a vending machine. Vehicles are stuck on the top and delivered to people with elevators on the ground level. The vertical stacking of vehicles becomes a landmark. The movement of bikes, cars, and scooters on the elevator makes the facade in constant motion. The machine is divided into volumes for vehicle storage. They storage cars, bicycles, scooters, and one volume on the center is a giant 7-Eleven. This simulation is shown at rush hour. The vertical stacking liberates the ground floor. For that, the ground floor becomes a grab-and-go place. It is a place for people to grab and drop a vehicle and continue to their destination. The liberation of the ground allows for people to work freely and for the project to be better connected to the city. I believe that this project is possible to function today since we can order a vehicle from our phone ahead of time.
This is a shopping and transit experience placed on a busy traffic junction right over the NoHo train station. The main idea of building circulation is based on a simple logic of launch and slide, replicating a skiing experience with one point of constant flow on the street level, a vertical emitter to the top and slow sliding path back to the bottom. This is not merely a movement diagram, but a starting point for creating four distinct special experiences. The first one is that of finding yourself inside a mobility vessel. This bowl-shaped entrance works first like an attraction point and then as a mixer of all the different means of transportation flowing in from the city, penetrating and blending inside it. Here we will see the trucks that supply the market's back of house that runs on the top of the vessel, cars picking and dropping, grabbing and going, and all the pedestrians and micromobility coming into the site. The experience starts from the bottom of the bowl up from the train station, straight into the grab-and-go market, and into the core of the bowl. Where as you bike, or walk, or drive, or skate, you can always look up and see a floating market hanging over your head. Right before you find yourself on the top of the vessel, and on an elevated city ground that works as a skate park. Then comes the vertical movement a binary system for goods and people speeding up to the market, a combination of all views as cutting through and directing at all the different parts of the building all the way to the top. From here starts the shopping, twisting and turning on a continuous sliding route to the bottom. And what first looks like an inscription of pedestrian courses on a snake path actually turns into a navigating experience of alternating images where the 3D space, wider, narrow, introvert or extrovert, sets a multi-speed journey for the visitor. And now into the shops. Those blobby floating masses hanging over the vessel are actually three different stores sharing a common logic of open plans on a sequence of floors melting one into the other. Here, the vast openings makes the views from store to store on a constantly interactive environment. All those experiences, movements and views will come to be combined on our version of the transit market, one in steady connection and transaction with the city around it. This is the simulation of Karnak, and what we learned is that we can use columns to filter different size vehicles. And the next is the plan view of the whole market, and we can see there are buses, Uber, and different kind of vehicles going through the market. Next is the simulation of how cars and micro vehicles and Ubers going through the site. This is the president of our market. It has continued the space horizontally and creates rapid changing experience vertically. We believe such experience would be great for a market. So, in our proposal, we translate this 2D plan into a three-dimensional market space. We grab elements from Pinanesis, Camp Marcio, such as courtyards and flats, hallways, to design the Campo de Marcio village. In Campo Marcio village, people move from courtyard to courtyard. Pedestrians and light mobility are allowed. Pedestrians like to move on a amphilate space and light mobility moves on hallways. In this project, people experience spaces in four ways. In 13th century BC, Karma Grab and Go, in the 20th century, La Village Market, in the 19th century, Campo de Marcia Village, and in the 21st century, Mobility Highway that grabs around and becomes a connection between the spaces. In this video, we'll have a tour in this building. The Carnet Grab and Go is on the ground floor. It works as a sponge, meaning it attracts people from buses, cars, 
micromobilities and the subway train. We use different columns to define the space for different kinds of mobilities. People go up by the mobility highway. It is the connector of three markets in terms of form and the circulation. Now we move to the Lovelet market. Along the short side direction, each store is a unique, complete, and independent shopping area. But you can keep jumping from one world of a brand to another quickly through the bike lane. Now we are going up to the Campo Marzio market. It is like a shopping village. There is a path for bicycles, the other paths are for pedestrians only. The site is located in the South Park neighborhood of downtown Los Angeles. There are many attractions here, such as the Stample Center and Convention Center. It has many different modes of mobility like the Pico Station, bike sharing, scooter, and bus stop. There is an arrow platform and vertical of connections to the ground. There is a family of vertical connections served as transportation and parking places. This project seems like the High Line Park in New York. This skywalk not just works on its own to encourage people using micro-mobility, but it could also activate the great separated crossings in Los Angeles built in the 17th and 80s. This simulation shows how this skywalk works during a whole day. This arrow platform connects with different mobility and attractions, so that people can reach the destination directly or transfer to other places with the help of micro-mobility to solve the last one or two miles traffic problem. It puts different mobility on the same surface. What we could see is a spectacle of people doing things on the surface and spectators watching it at the same time. The studio between architecture takes as its main concern the capacity of the section to move beyond the serial stack and instead to develop complex spatial propositions for nesting together a parking garage and a gym. In his article, Successive Architecture, Preston Scott Cohen writes, gridiron urbanization led to what is still to this day the most pervasive governing spatial principle of architecture, vertical succession, the unartistically considered non-hierarchical piling of discrete horizontal slabs of space, one atop the other. Vertical succession relegates the architect's role to designing facades and interior surfaces. This dissolution of sectional hierarchy and the subsequent relegation of architecture to a tinkering at the edges points to a series of problems that are at the heart of this first year core studio. Namely, what can a section do and what, if any, is its relationship to the elevation? In this studio, we look to the section as a place of great intensity that could dislodge expected relations between parts, as well as expose and choreograph alternative sequences and organizations of view and action. With this in mind, we focused on the section's generative orientation and architecture, rather than strictly seeing it as a post facto analytical instrument. In an effort to immediately challenge and interrogate the limitations of the stack, we began the studio by engaging a parking garage as an incitement for the development of a sectionally charged proposal, paying particular attention to four parking types, straight ramps, ramp floors, split level, and helical ramps. While at first glance, the organization and circulation of cars in a parking garage may seem a banal and burdensome coordination of metrics, turning radii, numerical capacity, structural spacing, the arrangement of cars offers an immediate engagement with sectional motivations. 
In this sense, the parking garage is understood as a kind of sectional ready-made, preloaded with stubborn logics and formal resistance, against which an architectural proposition could be forwarded. In lieu of a precedent, we endeavored to understand and tame the highly specialized workings of parking garage structures and their discrete typologies, finding that once the basic parameters of parking were understood, a great range of possibilities became apparent in the choreography of ramps, slabs, stacks, splits, and spirals. At a large scale, parking provides a coarse sectional strategy that dislodges the serial flat plane as a given datum of a building while remaining adherent to the necessities of movement and use. It is these qualities of the parking garage, its prescriptive limitations, as well as its potential exuberances, that we imagined as the fraught datum against which a second set of concerns might take root. As architecture is rarely allegiant to a single set of concerns, the forces that motivate the arrangement of spaces are always multiple and rarely straightforwardly resoluble. In part two of the studio, we introduced a secondary set of programs, which operate at a different sectional measure that of the recreational gym, with its specifications for wet and dry zones, small and large activities, as well as its rituals of use. Rather than consider these two programs as merely coexisting side by side or above and below, we imagined an opportunistic intermingling of the two. This expanded set of considerations of scale, volume, organization, and movement was interpreted in each proposal as complementary, oppositional, or otherwise with the initial parking structure and necessitated an architectural proposal that could manage both propinquity and juxtaposition. As the demands of the brief <clears throat> required an extended distribution of parking and gym in section, so too does each proposal require an approach to continuities and discontinuities in sequence and movement. That is to say, a considerable amount of pressure was placed on developing a strategy of organization and then to develop a strategy of circulation that could advance the spatial ambitions of each project while establishing coherence and legibility, legibility for use. Finally, in part three, the internal struggle of the constituent parts within came to bear on the elevation. Here, the section's hidden nature, its knowability revealed only through the projection of an abstract cut, helped us position the range of operations afforded by the outward facing and immediately available elevation. That is, just as the section cut reveals, the elevation conceals. In the end, the elevation is what we see, the outermost surface of an enclosure, whether inside or out, its insistent visibility masking whatever ingenuity the section might have lying within. Working on a tight infill lot in downtown LA, the proposals finally confront the regulating lines of the city, setting the internal workings of the building into tension with the exterior and provoking a discussion on insides and outsides, their modes of production and reception, as well as their respective allegiances. Between what is revealed and concealed, what is read and what is experienced, this studio asks how working in section differs from other ways of seeing architecture, what it makes available and by what means, and how we might consider the section's connection to what we find what is finally revealed at the elevation. In my project, I was interested in exploring the ways in which an envelope could articulate the various edge conditions of the interior, and how this would in turn result in different atmospheres, questioning the physical forces of the building. In search of a non-repeating stack, I explored the effects of rotating and truncating slabs. The result led to every floor plate being unique, establishing individual relations between parking and gym on every floor. Such led to various spatial organization in which small programs and core became nested within larger ones. This also led to an opportunity found between the slab edges within the voids, allowing for spaces to be suspended. In terms of organization, the parking circulates around the gym. Gym programs requiring less light and shorter durations are located on lower levels. Vertical circulation consists of two stairs, one fire stair that aligns to the orientation of the slab and one external one that connects to the suspended spaces. The framework acts as a puppeteer of the slab, so to speak, articulating the push and the pull of the interior space by controlling the slab's movements and gestures. It also acts as the mediator between the section and the elevation. I was particularly interested in the relationship between the section and the elevation, specifically regarding their appearance to the street. In this case, the light framework, which holds and articulates the outermost skin, gives the appearance of structural instability, whereas the deep interior slabs give a sense of solidity and mass. The envelope thus takes on the role of instability, tightly wrapping the framework and its content, revealing its hard interior, whilst also disorientating the height levels with its sails. 
The openings crossing diagonally through multiple floors reveal extroverted moments within the building. And the suspended spaces become a piece of resistance within the program, pushing back on the envelope. The party wall highlights the descending sales geometry. Within the section, one begins to see the relationship between the physical forces pushing and pulling the section and the envelope. On the one hand, the degrees of curvature within the envelope give an outwards expression of the interior voids and the rotation of slabs. On the other hand, the mesh is interrupted at moments where the slab approaches the perimeter. The exterior enters the interior, creating moments of double enclosure in which the second layer refines the articulation of the rotating slabs, highlighted by the tensile twist in the mesh. The program and envelope thus begin to merge, as seen where the pool appears to be carried by the mesh and hung from the framework. The mesh thus also takes on the role of banisters, trapeze, and safe, trapeze safety nets, thus beginning to act as thresholds. The cross sections highlight the atmospheric voids created by the rams, alternating from one-way to two-way systems, setting a tone expressing a change of rotation of the slab. The plans carry equal significance to the section and elevation. They demonstrate the atmospheric implication that arise from the framework puppeteering the slab. On the third floor, for example, the slab has adopted a sense of elasticity in which its corners are being pulled by the framework and the load of the water then deformed it. Ultimately, the project aims to question the physical relationships between the slabs, the frameworks, the envelope, and its suspended spaces, leading to atmospheric qualities. The envelope almost punctures the interior, thus nearly becoming the program, as seen here where, in which it transforms into the tra trapeze safety net. Although the suspended spaces are the pièce de résistance and physically push back on its envelope, from the interior it was designed in such a way to question whether it is pushing back or whether it is simply being sucked in by the envelope. Ultimately, that is what this project is about, questioning the section, questioning whether the section controls the elevation or vice versa. However, this is only achieved by establishing the section as a stable controller to which the envelope surrenders. Hi, this is a project by Stephen Katz. This studio is about a rigid system of parking coexisting with a nuanced program to develop section. Utilizing helical ramps not for its figural properties, but as an organizational device which allows for vertical movement. This device is the catalyst for making deep sectional space and allowing a sequence to emerge in the organization of this section. This project attempts to reconcile with what is an urban streetscape as wrapped slash packed into a dense container in an urban infill condition and it is the helical organization that allows for this. It is taking an urban landscape complete with entourage and folding it into a box and moving it vertically through a logical sequence of occupation that relates to and allows for an emerging organization of programs. The experience subverts the urban landscape and creates new ephemeral atmospheric moments Spatial experience where it becomes about producing nuanced moments. Moving through the space from scene to scene, secondary elements of circulation, vertical stair and tube, start to subvert that organization and produce yet another environment that allows for a short circuiting of that urban condition, delving deeper into the section. This project seeks to blur the boundary between representation and architecture, where graphic becomes the impetus for developing actual physical features at the level of facade. Representation is also the device that renders complex spatial conditions deep within the section. In plan, it's possible to read the tile of the helix twice at the ground level, once as the entry point vertically, and once as the point of exit. The tile occurs three times at other levels, facilitating upwards or downwards circulation. The tubes make a presence as an interruption of that sequence, stitching together multiple programs of parking and gym vertically. In closing, 
Elevation serves to suppress the section in lieu of continuity of program at the periphery, and in other instances reveals the section as the moment of intensity deep within the building. People move through space with different cadences, creating different patterns with different intentions. What dictates these flows? This project examines how surface gives rise to movement and how a surface is informed and reinformed by movement and use. A control curve informs the slab, which informs slopes and ramps of various inclines, giving rise to various types of stairs. The stair then informs human flows and activities. The original control curve is not static. It evolves as it yields and adapts to the program. Changes in inclines give rise to program. Change in incline indicates a change in state or change in program. Slope and program resist each other and inform each other. The section is a consequence of slope and program. This project examines how tectonic surfaces push back on the human body and influence behavior and movement through space. This gym does not contain standard exercise machines. Instead, it contains a series of surfaces conducive to various activities at various levels of exertion, applying different resistances on the human body. Slope surfaces interfere with human movement through space. The project is located on an infill site in downtown Los Angeles, and the proposed building reacts to those on either side of it. The section, through slope and stack, communicates program and activity within the building. Through variation and slope, the section reveals levels of resistance and exertion. The transverse sections, unlike the long sections, reveal primarily linear circulation across the slab from one program to another. Slab slopes and curvatures are tuned to the different cadences of vehicular and pedestrian circulation through space. The elevation responds to internal conditions by indexing thresholds, concealing some programs while exposing others. The elevation operates at two scales, the horizontal fine grain highly calibrated acting locally and the vertical coarse grain acting globally. While the transverse and long sections translate program and activity differently, the elevations remain contiguous around the building, tracking state and behavior changes within. Cables diverge, converge, and bunch in response to internal programmatic conditions in order to create transparency, translucency, and opacity. Exploring further the potential of a cable screen system, the elevation alters cable dimensions in response to programmatic shifts. The figure ground indicates sections of the facade which are opaque, transparent, and translucent. Thresholds are defined by a change from horizontal surface to inclined surface, by a change in degree of incline, and by a change in stat type. Thresholds indicate a change in state or change in behavior and are defined by surface tectonics. Shadows in plan from the elevation screen produce effects that correspond to programmatic states. These shadows both react to interior program and influence it. Architecture is often faced with the task of bringing together two often diametrically opposed entities. Combining a gym with a parking garage seemed one such pairing. This project examines the subliminal interferences caused by sloping surfaces in the production of behavior suited for both programmatic conditions. These interferences manifest as resistance on the human body.
Welcome to Los Angeles Portrait. I'm Yara Ferrali, and I'm uh, happy to uh, give you a glimpse into what we've been working on. Uh, Los Angeles Portrait is a research studio that attempts at addressing the complexities of our city cultural messiness. The use of the word messiness is meant in the most positive way, away from clean ideologies. We explore Los Angeles' lush diversity by uncovering its multiple layers of resolution and speculate through interactive storytelling on the near future of cultural space. Each student chooses um, Los Angeles neighborhood to research. While I continue to explain what we've been working on, you will be seeing the work of uh, the designers in the studio looking at UCLA campus, Rodeo Drive, San Juan Capistrano, Old Town Pasadena, the Gross Farmers Market, Downtown Broadway, the Hollywood Sunset Strip, Westwood Village, Olvera Street, and Downtown Chinatown. And research becomes a search where we scroll through infinite TikTok videos, Instagram posts, YouTube channel live streams, and other interfaces where LA's identity are portrayed and celebrated for all their glorious messiness where discussions around architectural styles and genres turn into digital material filters and augmented reality add-ons, where aesthetics is bound to cultural identities and neighborhoods, borders, politics, where economics and social system have a direct physical impact manifested through their aesthetics. The theoretical framework is based on Carson Harris writing on the Bavarian Rococo, more precisely on the architectural element of the cartouche the architectural boundary, the edge, that it was meant to frame one realm from the other, to divide the divine from the profane, find itself broken. In other words, we don't know if the puto is part of the pictorial realm or the three-dimensional stucco realm. The framing device itself was meant as a boundary, an edge, and is completely dissolved. The cartouche, the frame, is broken. We are interested in architecture as a visual apparatus. We believe that architecture's most speculative proposal comes from ways of looking at things, perceiving, seeing, and we will design with these multiple layers of representation. Learning from the bazaars, understanding of the act of rendering through the usage of words like entourage, mosaic, and pochet, in order to understand their evolution and speculate on what they have become today. So we documented these neighborhoods through the use of photogrammetry and working from 2D images using convolutional neural networks for image style transfer, then moving into 2.5D using photogrammetric technique of Ba and high relief, then to 3D uh, making, uh, producing cabinet of curiosity to finally arrive at the fourth layer, which is the 3.5D with a production of moving images through GIF and narrative storytelling, redefining the Bavarian Rococo frame from 2D to a fully 3D immersive and inhabitable frame. Our conversation, we question the expectations of architectural research, the standardization of drawing representation and rigid historical canon. Each designer has developed their own workflow, language and position associated with their specific neighborhood. Los Angeles Portraits is an invitation to open a discussion on space's identity through various means of searching and registering them. We speculate through ways of seeing on possible stories for Los Angeles Portrait. So that's a quick glimpse into what we've been working on. We look forward to sharing it with all of you. Thank you so much. And thank you from everyone in our studio. Chinatown is an interesting place that exists in every major city on earth. Different Chinatown in different locations represent the local condition of the city. Chinatown has the incredible ability to adapt to local materiality and specific building environment while still maintaining the Chinese architectural style. In Matthew Hunter's modeling, A Secret History of Following, he talks about the difference between the original, copy, mimic, and follow. While the copy is a direct replica of the original target, 
Mimicking comes with alternation but still maintains the honesty to the original target. Following is in a different realm altogether. Although it's still honest with the origin, it set up rules for people to learn from and thus producing what he calls make-believe objects that are different products than the original. The series of phone is another way to explain this concept. This is the original iPhone, and this is a copy of it that looks exactly the same, and this one is an iPad here that looks almost the same by mimicking, but it's already recognizable as another phone. And this last one represents a brand new type of phone that still remains a little bit of the trade, but is already considered another phone. By this translation, I would say that it's a step of following. Chinatown can also be categorized in the same way. This is the image of original Chinese architecture and a copy of it in Seattle and a mimic of it in Los Angeles, which is still recognizable as Chinese architecture, but is influenced by the local Los Angeles building environment. And for, by this one, by following, we collect the objects and turning something into something totally different. By categorizing all the different ornamentation elements by openings, decoration, column caps, etc., I can start to see the specific elements that create a recognition image of Chinatown. I explored different views of following this project. At first, I used conventional neutral network technology to transform the original super flat images of the openings in Chinatown into highly ornamented images. By using 3D scanning, the result of imperfect geometry introduced the sense of adding resolution by adding depth to the original ornamentation and thus transformed Chinatown's super flat architectural style into a highly decorated ornamentation. Then I explored the possibility of turning two-dimensional image into 3D models. What is fascinating to me is whenever we look at Google Earth 3D scanning, we can easily recognize the image of Chinatown, even though it's just a basic cube with texture resulting from the images. To me, this idea is really similar to draping a texture on a simple geometry. According to the statement, Chinese architecture style can be replicated anywhere by using the draping techniques. So why not using it on Western architecture canons? After tailoring the corners, apertures, and edges, I start creating the texture and draping back to the original geometry. With these techniques, the misalignment is produced and Casa di Musica turns into a make-believe Chinatown. After developing the techniques to wrap the exterior, I'm interested in looking at the interiority and see how the draping technique can be applied. I saw the way by using conventional neutral network techniques to imagine a loft space in Los Angeles Chinatown style and create a space according to the transformed images. I produce building elements and home appliances that are transformed into Chinatown make-believe versions. Here is a catalog of Chinatown at home that you can buy for your own make-believe Chinatown. Here is a review of, from a YouTuber of our product. Hello everyone, welcome back to JT's channel. Today I'm going to play this game called Chinatown at Home. I haven't played it before, so this is my first time. I hope you guys enjoy this video. On the left of the panel, there's edit tools. On the right, there's a um, pull down menu for furniture and the objects. And I already 3D scanned my room yesterday, so it looks really clean right now. You can also choose from the template. So let's start with adding some windows and doors. Ooh, this door looks fancy. Is that a chicken? Oh yeah, it's a chicken. Okay. Oh, that's a big window. There's a lot of collection of wallpapers. They look really cute. I really like that purple one. I'm going to add it here. Here's some wall decorations. Add some here as well. Some more on the wall. Adding stairs, handrails. There's a lot of furniture and uh, objects. Ooh, this fish looks super cute. I'm going to put that in the bathtub. Nobody's going to shower anymore. I really like the kitchen appliance. Everything has small roofs. Look at that microwave. It's just super, super cute. Okay. Oh, that's that Buddha. I'm going to put it um, here. Okay. I think there's a lot of objects that's really weird. Like this wall mountain lion light. Okay, I feel we're almost done with the first floor. Let's add some furniture on the balcony. Okay, let's decorate my bedroom now. Oh, look at this bed. It looks so nice. It looks like a house in a house. I would definitely sleep in that. Okay, I think it's getting really, really cool. Let's add the balconies. Oh, the lanterns. I really like these lanterns, like real Chinatown lanterns. I'm going to add a lot. I'm going to add some here as well and here. Okay, we're done. We have a lot of money left. Okay, let's look around. 
It's actually super good. I think I'm a genius. I'm getting this. I, I'm killing it. I am the best Chinatown builder. Okay, I'm excited. Let's see what we'll be like in real life. Ooh. Now we're in the house. This is the bed. Let's go downstairs. Ooh. It looks really weird. You, it feels like you're actually in Chinatown. Here's a cat. In the kitchen. Can I open that fridge? No, I can't. This is the entrance. Can I go into the bathroom? Nope. I'm really curious what's outside. Let's go outside. Ooh. It actually looks really weird. Like, everything else is empty. Okay. Alright, that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and share this video to all of your friends. So, I will see you next time. Bye! Thank you guys so much for your attention. Please do follow us on Instagram and subscribe our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. U.S. City. The world dumps its electronic waste into sites in developing countries in Africa and Southeast Asia, creating toxic working conditions for the inhabitants tasked with recycling these parts. Southeast Asia is projected to be largely underwater due to massive sea level rise, which will lead to massive migration and economic collapse. U.A. City proposed the formation of a brand new urban development located in the vicinity of Phnom Penh, designed to process the entire world's e-waste. Based on the linear and organic formation of a reaction diffusion pattern, this new city will be able to accommodate for an ever-expanding urban layout that can optimally store, process, and recycle e-waste through a combination of urban design and human-robot collaboration. The capital of Cambodia, Phnom Penh. In order to create an industrial development through machine learning, we created color maps of Singapore and Hong Kong. To increase the efficiency of production, we use the natural pattern of molecules in urban planning. The lines are connecting and deforming based on the arrays of diffusion. The final pattern has been determined by the order of processes from e-waste recycling to lithium-ion battery production. From this model, we can see how the building heights are formed in the z-axis of the whole urban map. Recycling factory. This diagram shows the process of e-waste recycling and the division of human labor and machine labor. After automated importing process, recycles are being cut and disassembled by factory workers before they transport to their storages. The transportation process is made by a combination of automated packaging vehicles that the combination emerged an organic form inside the industry. Residential areas and storage. Storage buildings are a form of interlocking modules where the storing and transferring materials are automated through the infrastructure. Lithium mine industry. By using the recycled material, the city will generate lithium-ion battery. All the process will be automated and interlocking to each other so that it will create a circular composition in order to work as a one giant factory. So our story is about a city as a machine, which follows the process of production, starting from recycling to lithium-ion industry, where the whole process is under surveillance. Enjoy!
Welcome to a journey through Battery City. The project has been developed as a cautionary tale. An enormous battery demand is impending upon the world. This project identifies its potential site and its development. As the project commences, it calls upon us to develop themes in foresight of capitalistic market shifts that would potentially inflict catastrophic environmental effects if left unplanned. The site is in the coastal city of Sao Luis, Brazil, strategically placed at the edge of the Amazonian River and the resource-rich Amazonian rainforest. This site lies adjacent to the landlocked lithium triangle of Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. Currently dominating 80 to 90 percent of lithium production of the world. It is no news that the Amazonian rainforest has been suffering unfortunate depletion at the hands of our anthropogenic activities, most identifiable of these being the ramp rampant deforestation that has reduced forest cover over 11,000 square kilometers in two years. That's roughly eight times the size of Los Angeles. Another major anthropogenic activity has been identified as mineral mining and refinement. Rich with resources, the place, is, the place is vulnerable to increased mining and refinement activities and a consequent urban sprawl. A distinctly compelling feature of this site is the daily sun exposure of six hours and an annual average of 2,313 hours. World lithium consumption faces a marked rise, the effect of which can be seen in the mining images on the right. This rise in demand stems from the new market for renewable energy needs and products. 2050 is predicted to see a market shift to renewable energy consumption in the form of lithium-ion batteries produced for automotive, industrial, and portable needs. To identify impending trends, we employ the use of machine learning algorithms such as VGG19, pix to pix and CycleGAN. We elect a site and train it for an Anthropocene state. Over this, we overlay a grid of development through a scripted algorithm that allows us to generate this color map. We use this color map to further predict an urban sprawl on the site. This animation illustrates a Delphi survey. The transition of the site from a depleting rainforest to a dreadful desolation of lithium refinement. We identify deforestation and the inevitable industrial extraction and refinement on this site as our major design problems around this. We strategized a condition for reforestation while also capitalizing on the market demands. For this, we employed another layer of machine learning algorithm that allows us to redesign our forest through color codes. In the image on the left is the map with, in its original state. This was later mapped to a uh, intermediary state of reforestation and then the final state of reforestation with the vertical megacity towers. These are some zoom-ins of the current reforest and fully reforested sites. A city that works as a machine within itself to meet the world's battery needs emerged in the city of Sao Luis, Brazil. We proposed a vertical expansion of an entire city sprawl through which emerged a mega city. This mega city is roughly 300 meters tall and 250 meters wide at the top. It is layered in the following ways. Evaporation at the top tier, collection, residential, refinement, manufacturing and storage. The hierarchy of functions can be understood through their role in the tower. The topmost layer of evaporation allows for a maximum exposed surface for surface area for uh, evaporation during the day, followed by collection chambers that are directly connected through the monocoque of the structure, followed by a residential level where the workers of the tower are housed. The skin or the monocoque of the mega structure is derived from the stranglophic root system, which grows in the dark forest, competes for light, does not root on the ground, and germinates atop another tree. This was ideal for the conditions that we were trying to induce in our mega city, wherein the top part maximizes its exposure to the sun, 
for greater evaporation surface and uh, the rest of the building functions are housed where the outer skin serves not only as the structural system but also the transportation system in the mega city tower let us now take a look at the trailer of this mega city The following six proposals for a new Oxnard ferry terminal are ground forms whose place and time are synchronized with three imaginary settings of an Oxnard in varying symbioses with sea level rise, two projects per setting. Kenneth Frampton's postulation of megaform as urban landscape inspires the efforts and focus of this studio. It is simultaneously informed by the vigors of the combinatory topologies described by Claude Parent and Paul Virilio in The Function of the Oblique. With that said, this studio is not a landscape urbanism studio. Instead, it is a ground form urbanism studio that puts stock in prioritizing ground as construct ed, as artifice over land as seemingly unconstructed, as innocent nature. By invoking form and formation, and spiking organization and profile with variable grades of inclination, the term ground form champions an architecture of eruptive, if not disruptive appearance and force. That is a punchy emergent, feature-rich thing within an inchoate field, rather than an architecture that disappears, politely retiring as if camouflaged to dissolve into anything and everything but architectural form. The archipelago setting is imagined as a knowing future from a distant past when the ground was fashioned with foreknowledge of its gradual disappearance, as a chain of tilted and tilting islands structured around canals and dams with a fabric comprised of sedimentations of oceano-urbanic ruins over time. These projects are quasi-geological, porous, piled, shell-like, and bleached. Wei and Wu's residual strata is a layered monolith of a terminal whose interior boarding platforms sit in grotto channels with walls that expose the buildup of the crushed rocky remains of earlier oxnards. Wu and Zhou's stretched esplanades is a delicate fanning, fractal extending a radial array of coastal walking surfaces along and into the ocean. The grid setting conjures a parallel rationalist oceanic courtyard-based urbanism where the figure ground binary is deliberately inverted, reversed, and disoriented at its intersections and edges to create forms with fluctuating edges and stepped, cavernous, protracted interiors. Crossroads, intersections become both figure and ground, and the traditional urban block is an emptied field of salty water or low-rise configurations. 
Groza and Kana's woven nodal exchange packs the cardo and decamanus of its courtyard-based urban structure with mass, density, and volume while fracturing the surfaces around the intersection with stepping plates that gather activities and interrupt the horizon. Gurgling beneath the turbulence are ferries that emerge and disappear from a corner of the gridiron on the round-trip journeys to the Channel Islands. Wang and Zhang's tiered groundform lives up to its name and similarly packs an intersection with mass and volume but with feathered terracing that amplifies the threshold between constructed ground and aqueous court edge, between arrivals, departures, and the architectural orders of civilization. The port setting is a near-future imaginary where long-term planning instantiates a mega-scale relocation of the Los Angeles port to Oxnard. The two ferry terminals in this human-made ecology are oriented and orienting assemblages and platforms at the gateways of an oceanic megalopolitan theater of logistics and its supports. Brown and Knudsen's framing fluus a lithe, attenuated shed-like structure whose body is of the thinnest bones. The serial frames are analogs for film frames, periodically pausing the hustle-bustle of the world around it into stills and portraits which quickly zoom in and out of focus. Situated at the farthest corner from the mouth of the harbor, trips to and from it extend its capacity to both arrest and release perceptions of flux. Strezepec and Waddle's constructivist slip is an extended pier of stretched, cascading triangulated plates that energize the elongated aircraft carrier like terminus as it points purposefully westwards and beyond to the far east. In sum, the six sectionally and volumetrically active, plan agitative projects expand on foundational disciplinary ideas of edge and threshold, figure, ground, landscape urbanism, and the continuous surface. <laughs>